belongs to Jesus. Who will stand against our King? No one can. No one will. Oh, oh, oh. victory belongs to Jesus. Victory belongs to Him. Oh, oh, oh. oh. above all things temper but in the name that he has given to himself and it is for our benefit and he has come down to us so that we can better understand more of his character in the revelation of his name and we will see a few of them as you go to the next page uh, God the word El or Elohim means a strong mighty one to be feared these are things you need to memorize yes. and and don't just let it pass by try to put something in your brain get something in your system so you will know a little something yes. El Elion, the most high god not in a comparative sense that he's higher than any other god there is no god other than him so uh, it's it's a phrase that expresses um how how exalted he is how exalted he is I saw him high and lifted up. So it's not in a comparative sense. Adonai, to judge or to rule. El Shaddai, Almighty God, the all sufficient one, the all powerful one. It stresses greatness, but not the meaning of fear, as he's a fearful one, or, or he's a consuming fire, or you can't touch him. It, it doesn't carry that sense. Yeah. As in El Elohim. Jehovah or Yahweh, the grace of God, the existing one. This is the covenant name for God. It's important to understand that. And we see there are 22 covenants in scripture. We're just giving those uh, associated with the name Jehovah, like Jehovah Jireh, my provider. You know, this could preach. Amen. The next <laughs> seven, eight titles you can preach Jehovah Jireh, my provider, Jehovah Rapha. Yeah my healer jehovah nisi my banner or he who covers me with his banner jehovah shalom my peace jehovah shabbat the fighting captain of the armies of heaven he is the commander in chief of all the angelic hosts jehovah ra ah, mother shepherd my heavenly shepherd jehovah shama my uh, covering my my um he's always there jehovah sitkinu He's there too. <laughs> in the New Testament names and meaning, God, Theos, is equivalent to Elohim. In the Old Testament, Lord, Kurios, equivalent to Adonai. And Father, Peter, uh, Latin and Greek. Uh, they say they have no Old Testament equivalent, but I found one. It's Abba. Uh, largely because Abba is Aramaic. And it was spoken in, in the Old Testament. So I love the word Abba and it, it is... Found in, in Romans, when when we, the Spirit of the Lord, gives us the privilege to say, Abba, Abba. Father. It's a word slaves cannot use. They, it's not allowed. It's only for sons, bona fide sons and daughters. Mm. And so, mm. I, I every morning, I address God as Abba. Oh, Father. My Abba. I write it down. Dear Abba. My, my Abba. Uh, that's the kind of person personal relationship you have um, and Jesus would call him that several times so hallelujah let's move on to the nature of God there are a few things we'll see what it says in the unity of God the divine nature Watch these words. The divine nature is undivided and indivisible. But there is one infinite and perfect spirit. God is a spirit. Remember that. Yes. He's not merely one. He is the only one. Yes. There cannot be more than one all-inclusive, more than one ultimate, more than one God. And God cannot be divided into parts. So that this God that we are talking about is indivisible. You can't divide it. 
but we will see if that conflicts with the idea of Trinity. The burden of the Old Testament was the unity of God. But it also taught that that's also taught in the New Testament. And here we have some scriptures, uh, Deuteronomy, one Lord, Isaiah, beside me there is no God, Isaiah, there is no God beside me, John, only true God, Corinthians, no God but one, Timothy, blessed and only God, Ephesians, one God. So the idea of pronouncing that there's, rather announcing that there's only one God is, pre, is prevailing in scripture. Uh, thirdly, this unity does not destroy the doctrine of the Trinity or the tri-unity of God is which I would prefer to use. We believe in three persons in the Godhead but one God and now it gets complicated. So how do we have one God and we have three persons but we don't have three gods? Because it's a compound unity. It is not a three gods coming together to form one. So we've used these illustrations several times with three forms of water. Ice is a form, mm -hmm. steam is a form, and water is another form. But it's essentially, it's the same water. Mm -hmm. Or the three angles of a triangle uh, make up one triangle. So you, you can try a different illustration, but it's very difficult for us to explain God. Let it be known that great is the mystery of God and who he is. And there isn't a theologian who can uh, explain God. However, the Bible gives us some insights and some tall telling tales as to how God's constitution is made. So in the unity of God being one, we do not destroy the doctrine of the Trinity, which is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit equal God. Point D, there are three monotheistic religions. That means there are three religions of the seven major religions of the world that believe that there is only one God, and that's Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. The heathens have many gods because they have no one God that's satisfied. And so everything is a God. Mm. And the ideas of polytheism, which means many gods, tritheism, which means three gods, and dualism, which means two gods or one God with two faces, two faces like the Romans, um, Janus, you see January is the first uh, month of the year in the Roman calendar, Janus is a two-faced God. So he's facing last year and he's facing the next year. Um, and so that's what we're talking about, dualism, the two-faced God. The God we serve is neither polytheistic, he's not many uh, different gods, yet there's a pluralism in himself that uh, is hard to conceive. And that's what El Elohim means, uh, the I am is the, the cruel form of the word. Roman numeral two, God is a spirit. Mm. As such, he is not material. You can't touch him like that. He has a substance that is uncreated. He is who he is and what he is. Our finite minds get a little glimpse of his substance. When God wanted us to know what he looked like, he manifested himself in his son, Jesus Christ. And the Bible is very clear that Jesus Christ is the express image of God. The definite, the exact image of God in so much that Jesus said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. For I came out of the bosom of the Father. The Father and I, we are one. One in essence, one in being, one in substance, one in material, but separate for offices. If you can catch that, that the offices of the Godhead are different, but their essence is the same. The same is similarly, uh, of similar material, then we won't have a problem. So that's how you have to look at it. In essence, in nature, the Godhead is the same. But in office 
and in manifestation they have operated differently how the father became the son so that the son could become the savior and that God could still remain God on the throne and Jesus being God can still call upon his father and said my God my God why have you forsaken me or when he rose from the dead would say to Mary I go to my God and to your God to my father and to your father so here is a not a conflicting but an explaining view of the relationship between God the Father and God the Son how the Son who is God submitted himself to the Father in the great kenosis theory in Philippians 2 the self emptying of God he who being in the form in the morphe yeah. in the exact yeah. image of God thought it not robbery to remain God he didn't think he was losing anything when he he decided to take upon him the form of a servant, become a man, losing his heavenly reputation in the eyes of the angel, becoming a, uh, identifying with filthy mankind, although he was not, but becoming one of us so that he can go to the cross and die. Oh, the marvelous mystery of such beautiful grace and the love that the Father had that in the, before the beginning of the world, he had planned this thing out for us. Hallelujah. Can I hear him? Amen. So he is not material. He is spirit. God is not dependent upon matter. God doesn't need earth to walk. So the water doesn't matter to Jesus. He can walk anywhere, anything. Wow. There are many instances in scripture, well not many, two or three where Jesus eluded the crowd. He actually became a vapor and, and went through the crowd and they couldn't, they couldn't push him over the cliff, they couldn't touch him. He actually became that, uh, that immaterial substance. Hallelujah. A material concept of God the Father is foreign to scripture. So that means we cannot put God in a physical form, in a physical body, in a physical shape. His spirit, but we will see when he has manifested himself, how he took on the form and shape of a man simply because we may get better understanding of who he is, his structure. Because God, remember, man is made in the image and in the likeness. That's in the shape and the form of God. So that when you saw Jesus Christ, you saw the shape and the form of God. That's the deductive reasoning. That, that's, that's reasonable. If God, if man is made in the image and in the likeness of God, that means he looks somewhat like the shape and structure of God. I do believe God has shape and structure, as we will see, but yet he's a spirit being. And we cannot pin him down to any one form or shape, so that he is who he is and chooses to be what he wants to be. At any time, he is God, the sovereign Lord. Amen. Amen. When we say God is the spirit, by that we mean he's incorporeal, not subject to human limitations. As I said in the gospel, you see that he's invisible. You cannot see him with the naked eye. Even if you've taken on a soulish form and even when you are raptured and you get a glorified body and you have glorified eyes, you still will not be able to see who God is. You'll never see his shape. You'll never see his form. Not now, not in eternity to come. He will forever be uh, invisible. And in the end time, as I told you, when uh, in the beginning, uh, Jesus, the Logos, was in the bosom of the Father. And in the end, the picture is going to change. God is going to wrap himself and deposit himself in the Son. So that no time you will ever see the Father. Because even now... The, Paul said, for God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. And that it pleased the Father that in Jesus Christ the fullness, the totality of the Godhead should dwell bodily in him. He's qualified to house and be the temple of the Godhead. Can I hear him? Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. So when you put all those things together, you, get, you see the, the power of the Godhead. You see the power of Jesus. You see the, the wondrous... Uh, the creation that God has done with uh, the manifestation. See, we must worship him therefore in spirit and in truth. In spirit 
as distinguished from place or form. When he said that to the woman, Samaria, she was boasting, you see this, this city here, this, this hill, this is our temple. This is where we Samaritans worship God. This was the place, the Mount of Blessings. This is where God chose to, to designate as the Mount of Blessing, Mount Jerusalem. And we in Samaria have it. You in Jerusalem don't have it. We have it. And then Jesus had to explain to us, a young lady, God is not uh, limited to a place, but it you're going to worship him. You've got to worship him in spirit and in the truth because he is a spirit and he's searching for people. Could you imagine that? Mm. Jesus came looking for sinners. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that, that which is lost. lost. Once the lost has been found and they become children of God, in the midst of the children of God, God is searching for worshipers. Yes. Because not everybody who gets saved becomes a worshiper. Amen. We may give you a two. Thank you, Lord, and a hallelujah here. But a worshiper? Mm, wow. For the Father seeketh such to worship, worship him. him. Yes. To worship him. Mm. And when they've been telling you worshiping is, is forgetting everything and just adoring his person and magnifying his, who he is and telling him all the wonderful things about what a wonderful Father provided, talking to him and telling him who he is. Yes. Worshiping his glorious yes. self. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Oh, bless the Lord. Thank That's you, wonderful. Lord. So uh, his spirit distinguishes form and place. And he is must be worshipped in truth as distinguished from false conception resulting from imperfect knowledge. Mm. And so that when you're going to worship the Father, you will worship him in the truth of his Son. Mm. You cannot know God without Jesus Christ. Impossible. Amen. You cannot. Amen. Amen. Jesus said, it pleases me. And who I reveal the Father yes. to, that's the only way that person will get to know about the Father. Jesus has to reveal the Father, and the Father has to reveal the Son by the agency of the Holy yeah. Spirit. Yes. Amen. So in that way, it's a closed kind of... Relationship. Yes, a <laughs> funny word. It's a closed fraternity that you can only get into by being allowed by either the father or the son. Mm -hmm. you, you can't you can't go in there any other house. So mm -hmm. praise the Lord. And once you know the truth, and Jesus is that truth. And once you know I am the way, the truth, and the life, see, I am the way to the Father. Mm -hmm. That's what it really means. I am the way to the Father. Yes. I am the truth about the Father. Yes. And I am the life okay. from the Father. Yes. So I am the way, the truth, and the life. And that connects him straight into the Father's bosom. Amen. Praise God. So, point D, problems. Those scriptures which ascribe to God bodily parts are anthropomorphic or symbolic. That means that God, when he says he has ears to hear, mm -hmm. does he have an ear like mine? Mm -hmm. He has eyes to see. When Isaiah says his hands are not short, does God have literal hands? Or are they expressions of God's ability to reach out and touch you? Well, they're symbolic in the sense it gives us a better understanding because we know what hands do, we know what ears do, we know what eyes do. And when we, we understand those capabilities and we reflect upon God, it, it dawns upon us, hey, God can hear me. Whether he has literal ears or not is not the point. God can hear me. God can see me. Yes. God can feel me. Yes. He is touched Hallelujah. with the feelings of our infirmities. Yes. So in that anthropomorphic way or like man style, that God gives us a glimpse of who he is so we can better understand our relationship yeah. with God. It's symbolic in that sense. And we do not feel that God has literal hands like this because he is spirit. 
But symbolically, yes, you can, you can say that. I have a problem with point two. When God appeared to the patriarchs, it was temporary manifestation of God in human form. Prefiguring the Son of God in the flesh. They call it a theophany or a pre-incarnate appearance. I understand the de definition, but I, I cannot subscribe to this idea that Jesus, the Logos, had a pre-manifestation of the Son of God before uh, the manger scene. So I'll leave it at that. You have any questions so far? Okay, thank you. Thirdly, God is a person. Not only God is a spirit, not only God has names, God is a person. Now we're going to see if I just contradicted what I was saying, that God is a spirit. God is a person. By that we mean that God has a personality. A personality means the power of self-consciousness and self-determination. That is what constitutes a personality. Two of the great uh, core uh, truths is I am implies self-consciousness. I will implies self-determination. That makes up a personality. If you don't have that, you're not. God possesses all the elements of personality. Therefore, he is a person. Further to that, I am and I will. We have God as a thinking creature. Cre uh, can't was it, use the word creature, the thinking being, because of his intellect. Exodus, I know. Genesis, I remember. Isaiah, let us reason together. Shows that God thinks. He has intellect. It's a part of his personality. He secondly has emotions or feeling. God loves. God hates. God is jealous. God is angry. Those are emotions, not just belonging to the human realm, but that God possesses them as well. And so we get them from him. Volition or will or the ability to choose. When God said, I will, he made a choice. When you say, I will, you've made a choice. God has made many, many such decisions. So therefore it goes to the area of volition or will. And that helps us to better understand that God is a personality. Not that God just has a personality. He is a person and by by being a person he has a personality see the names of God and the personal pronouns of God's personality are clearly expressed in scripture personal pronouns like he him is the yours thine uh, one of the things that we have an argument with in certain trends of thought and we do not subscribe to that is the feminine side of God and that since that God is genderless, they say that God leans more to the female side. And this is a, the feminists made their own Bible. They have translated their own Bible. And they have some um, verbs, some nouns, some words that are not neuter, but, but are uh, feminine in reference to God. And... Um, Take, for example, El Shaddai, the breasted one. God is breasted, therefore he is female. And uh, the idea of the word is not that he is female. It means he gives, uh, it's an image that he gives up to the young, like a, a mother word. And it's the motherhood of God they have taken up and, and ran away with it. And so that... We do not subscribe to the fact, to, not to the fact, to the idea that they are saying that God is feminine. Nothing to do with you ladies. Um, and I'm not disrespecting you. I'm saying that man was made in the image and likeness of God. But woman was made in the image and likeness of man. And I hope you don't take that wrong. Uh, that doesn't make you any less an image person. Because in Jesus Christ, there is neither male nor female. All of that is done away with. You are a child of God created through a born again experience to enter into the family of God without a gender identity. Can I hear him? There is neither male nor female in the body of Christ. So we are all one. Hallelujah. 
gender. He doesn't see gender. I am so glad for that. Image? Image. Just image. Yes. Not, not image. function. Not function. Image. Image. Shape, form. We, are, we don't have a shape like a woman. <laughs> <laughs> We're missing a few things. <laughs> yes, but if we, you know, his image looking at yourself with the mirror and sees me. Yeah, yeah. If a woman should go and look at herself, herself in the mirror and I should stand by her, she's different to me? Yes, yes. Outwardly. Um, spirit, soul, same thing. Uh, the distinction, actually, I could go into depths in this. Because, and I don't want to confuse you, because if I touch it, we'll have to go into it. Because when God created man, I want to tell you, no, don't let it go into it. Man is called he male. Woman is called she male. Isha. Isha. The she drops to fe, female. Mm -hmm. So a, a woman is really a male no. with a womb. Yes. That's right. Woman. Why do you think she's called womb woman? Man. Because she's womb a womb man. man. She's a man with a womb. That's right. So those are the technicalities. If we were going into that, we would go and then deal with it. But let's just be thankful. That women look like women <laughs> and men look like men. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> so there is no confusion. There is yeah. no confusion. I was going to put yeah. a post because everywhere you go, you find uh, cleavage and you find exposure so prevalent that I was going to say, listen, ladies, with all due respect, the mammary glands have biological functions too. English please is please cover up. Yeah. Amen. Let there be a great cover up in the house of God. Especially. Amen. Especially. I don't want to say it like how some preachers. Some preachers are raw, you know, and I, I can only go. He said, the church is now looking like Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> when you go in church, all you find now you see is legs, oh, breasts, and thighs. <laughs> it's the truth. I didn't say that. Some Pentecostal kind of preacher. Okay. So that will take care of of God as a person. <laughs> and now we we will come to the last four and a half uh, five minutes. God is a Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity is implied in the Old Testament, but not declared. <laughs> The plural name of God, Elohim, that's a plural form. Uh, the use of plural forms, of course, are pronounced for God, etc. The theophanies, especially the angel of the Lord. This is where they theologians get confused, and I am not confused. When the Bible says the angel of the Lord appeared, in my understanding, I take that literally. It's the angel of the Lord that appeared, not God in angelic form. Very simple, and I don't know why they, 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 because they do not want to admit certain truths, so they, they, they package it and put it there. But if the Bible says, because God said, I will send my personal angel to, to lead you. There was Jehovah's personal angel that led them out of uh, Egypt and through the, through the wilderness, not Jehovah. Jehovah always sat on his throne. Yes. There's only one or two times Jehovah moved. And it was the, um, the, 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 the three types of angels that we are accustomed to, to the cherubims and the seraphims. seraphims. But the ophanims, who are the ophanims? The ophanims are found only one or two times in the book of Ezekiel. They are the wheel within the yes. wheel, with the eyes on the wheel. Yes. They move the throne of God. Mm. They are special classified angel unlike anything else. Mm. If we were doing the study of angel, we would, we would touch on that. But Do man call angels Lord? No. Mm -hmm. You could call anybody Lord because Sarah called Abraham Lord. Yeah. I, I, in the spiritual sense that I'm talking about. No. Only Jesus is Lord. So when Abraham called the angel Lord. A term of respect. A term of 
Yes, my lord. That was the old They English. call king stuff. You you bow before English. my lord. Even in the, even in, in London, in the parliament, you still call them lord. In the House of Commons or wherever it is. The Lord? It's, it's a term of respect, but not in the term of worship. Because Abraham knew not to worship angels. That's what God loved about him, that he knew the difference between angels and that he saw God and had faith mm -hmm. in God alone. Amen. We talk about the angel of the Lord, divine and distinct from God the Father. I agree with that. But I disagree with that. It's a pre-incarnate manifestation of Christ. If it's an angel of the Lord, it's an angel of the Lord. The Bible clearly states that Jesus Christ was never an angel. He was made lower than the angel, but never an angel. Jesus was never an angel. He was made man, from God to man, not in between. Between God and man is the angelical realm. The triceps. The tri- Sagia, from the Greek word sagios, meaning holy, hagios, the tree holy or the intimates of the Trinity. We won't go into that. The ironic blessing, those are proofs that there's a triunity in the Old Testament. And in, finally, in the New Testament, the Trinity is explicitly declared but not explained. You can see the picture of the tree uh, uh, characters at the baptism of Jesus. When God spoke, the dove came, Jesus was in the water. In the baptismal formula, go baptize in the name of the Father, the name of the Son, and the name of the Holy Spirit. In the apostolic benediction, and the love of God, and the grace of Jesus Christ, and the comfort of the Holy Spirit be with you. So you find the three uh, mentioned at, at those times, in the teachings of Jesus. My Father, one, the Spirit says, it's about the Spirit sending, the Father sending the Spirit in the place of the Son. So the three were mentioned there. In the teaching of the New Testament, there, there is therefore a Father who is God, a Son who is God, and a Spirit who is God. So the, the, the idea of the Trinity is clearly uh, enunciated in the New Testament, but cannot be explained, and uh, bless the man who can. <laughs> So therefore, in conclusion, we accept without question that God is a spirit yes. and that his son is a manifestation of who God is and becoming flesh. Yes. And that God has a spirit is the Holy Spirit. Yes. I rest my case there and will go no further into it because it will not make sense to argue about the fine points in these fundamentals we accept what the Bible teaches. Amen? Amen. Any questions before you go? Well, praise the Lord. So next week we'll wrap up uh, on the Holy Spirit here and then we will move on to another area. And thank you for coming. I know it's... Uh, well, we have a nice mix on Wednesday night now. We uh, have worship, we have prayer, and we have a uh, half an hour Bible study. God bless you. Amen. Amen. And, and, and sister, thank you so much for for um, streaming. Streaming. Hundreds and hundreds of people are getting to see our yes. services now. Thanks to this wonderful couple and that little piece of equipment there. Beautiful quality. You should see the quality. Um, as a matter of fact, Sunday morning. While they were streaming, Guyana was copying it, and Guyana redistributed it, and, and, and that's what's happening. Many people are copying it and redistributing, and we don't know how many thousands. Uh, just in your area alone, how many thousand you have? 4, oh, I've got 4,000. You've got 4,000, 5,000, yes. 2,000, 2, 2, 6,000 multiplied if the word is going. Mm -hmm. South Africa, England, Africa, England UK, UK, Philippines, India, Philippines, Turkey, Turkey, Istanbul, Istanbul. It's Turkey, right? Praise the Lord. The word is going, and we're very happy for that. And thank you again for making it possible. Amen? Amen. Who's next?